Hello everyone, my name is Laura, and today I'll be talking to you about septic arthritis, which is inflammation of a joint due to bacterial or fungal infection. In today's lecture, we'll go over the following learning objectives. What is the differential diagnosis for acute monoarthritis? How can we confidently diagnose septic arthritis? What is the treatment? And lastly, what is the prognosis? We'll start by going over a case. We'll discuss pertinent findings on physical exam, what to consider based on our findings in our differential diagnosis, confirmatory laboratory studies, and prognostic indicators. We'll summarize at the end. Let's start out with the case. MK is an 18-year-old female with no past medical history who is brought to the emergency department by her mother. For the last week, the patient has had migratory joint pain and achiness involving multiple limbs. Two days ago, she began complaining of pain in her right knee that has been steadily worsening despite over-the-counter pain remedies. In the last few days, she developed fevers, chills, and trouble walking. Let's get some more history. Your patient has no past medical history, although she does endure similar joint pain in her left knee prior to the current presentation that has since resolved. She only takes oral contraceptive medication, and she denies alcohol, tobacco, or illicit. She is sexually active with one partner. Her family history includes a mother with hypertension and a father with type 2 diabetes. In her review of systems, you notice that she does endorse recent fevers without weight loss or night sweat. She has not recently been traveling or camping. She denies any chest pain, shortness of breath, nausea, or vomiting. She does tell you that she's had some dysuria or burning while she urinates in the recent past. There has been no blood in her urine or hematuria. She has not noticed any skin rash. Let's examine the patient. First, we look at her vital signs and notice that she's normotensive but tachycardic with a pulse of 106. She is also febrile with a temperature of 38.2. In general, she is mildly distressed, but cooperative with your exam. You notice that throughout the exam, she is holding her right leg straight. Her mucous membranes are dry, and she's tachycardic, but her rate and rhythm are regular. Her lungs are clear, and her abdomen is benign. Her right knee is visibly swollen, red, and quite tender to the touch. She has a large effusion. You compare her right knee to her left and notice that the findings are not symmetric. A full exam of all of her other joints is otherwise normal. She has no cyanosis, clubbing, or edema in her extremities, and a thorough skin exam reveals no rashes. So what's in our differential diagnosis? In a young, otherwise healthy patient with acute monoarticular arthritis, infectious etiologies should be at the top of our list. These are generally broken down into two major categories, gonococcal and non-gonococcal. Other etiologies include Lyme disease, although this patient denies any history of camping or tick bites, gram-negative rods, fungi, and mycobacterial infection. These last three are most typically seen in immunocompromised patients. However, we have no reason to suspect that our young patient is immunocompromised based on our history and physical. In monoarticular arthritis, the crystalline arthritides should also be considered, although these are less likely in a younger patient. The crystalline arthritides are gout, and pseudogout. Other 
although less likely possibilities, are rheumatologic and include rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, lupus arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and others. Last but not least, neoplastic etiologies should be considered because these are diagnoses that we don't want to miss. Neoplasms can be either benign or malignant. So based on what we know about our patient, which of these etiologies do you most likely suspect? If you said infectious, you're correct. Based on our patient's age and risk factors, this should be at the top of our differential. Now that we've established a leading diagnosis, which pathogen do we think is most likely implicated? Let's go over some common associations between risk factors and bugs to expect. Keep in mind that these are not hard and fast rules, but certain risk factors can raise or lower your suspicions for certain pathogens. In addition, a lot of these combinations are frequently found on tests. For instance, young or sexually active patients often get monoarticular joint infections with Neisseria gonorrhea. Disseminated gonorrhea infections can also come with migratory arthralgias, dermatitis or rash, and genitourinary syndrome. Patients with recent exposures to animal bites from domestic animals like dogs or cats could have been exposed to Pasteurella multocida. Patients with sickle cell disease and joint infection may be suffering from Salmonella. Patients with prosthetic joints are particularly predisposed to joint infection with Staphylococcus aureus, as are patients on hemodialysis, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and the elderly. Patients who use IV drugs are also at increased risk of developing joint infections with Staph aureus, as well as with Pseudomonas. Immune-compromised patients present a, a particular case because they are at risk for all of the bugs we've already discussed, in addition to more, including fungus, mycobacterium, and other less common infections that patients with normal immune systems are not as likely to get. So based on what we know about our patient, which of these infections do we most likely suspect? If you said Neisseria gonorrhea, you're correct. Keep in mind that our patient is young, sexually active, and also recently complained of migratory arthralgias as well as dysuria. This makes gonorrhea very likely. With a specific theory about the cause of our patient's arthritis in mind, let's consider what laboratory tests we need to obtain to narrow our differential and confirm a diagnosis. Arthrocentesis, or joint fluid sampling, is the most important test to perform in a patient with monoarticular arthritis. Fluid should be sent to the lab for cell count, gram stain and culture, wet prep, and crystal analysis. As seen on this slide, white blood cell count will give us a hint as to what process might be occurring in the affected joint. Between 200 and 2,000 white cells is considered non-inflammatory and suggests degenerative disease or trauma. Many red blood cells may also suggest trauma or other hemorrhage into the joint. Between 2,000 and 100,000 white cells suggest inflammatory processes such as crystalline arthritis or rheumatologic conditions. Greater than 100,000 white blood cells is highly suggestive of infectious or septic arthritis. Note that these values are just generalizations. You can have infectious processes with fewer than 2,000 white cells as well, especially if the patient is immunocompromised. The American College of Rheumatology Clinical Guidelines indicate that in a patient with unexplained inflammatory fluid, especially someone with a fever, the fluid is assumed to be infected until proven otherwise. Since gram stains or cultures can be falsely negative, urinalysis and urine culture, as well as blood culture, should also be obtained. A serum HIV test can assess for immune compromise and is appropriate in a patient at risk for sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea. 
Although we deferred it today, a pelvic exam is likely also indicated. A serum CRP, or C-reactive peptide level, will be elevated in 98% of cases with septic arthritis and can be used to monitor response to antibiotic therapy. Plain films of the affected joint can help assess for local destruction by infection or other process. Also, if you're worried about a neoplasm, this is a good first step. We send our battery of tests, and the first one back is our gram stain, which will help us direct antibiotic therapy as shown in this chart. The gram stain shows gram-negative cocci, consistent with our suspicions for Neisseria gonorrhea. In this case, prompt initiation of ceftriaxone is appropriate, as well as azithromycin for presumptive concurrent chlamydial infection. In very ill patients, there may not be time to wait for test results, and antibiotics should be administered as soon as possible. You brilliantly deduce that this patient had a case of disseminated gonorrhea and administered the appropriate ant management with ceftriaxone and azithromycin for presumptive chlamydia. She does not require arthroplasty, but stays in the hospital for a few days for observation, and after improvement is switched to oral cefixine. She comes to clinic five days after being seen in the emergency department for follow-up. During your visiting clinic, you take time to evaluate your patient's long-term prognosis. Prior joint injury, often seen in professional athletes or patients with previous joint surgeries, are predisposed to repeat infections. The infecting pathogen also impacts prognosis. One study found that up to 50% of patients with staph aureus septic arthritis did not return to baseline joint function. Fewer than 10% of pneumococcal septic arthritis cases cause permanent damage. The prognosis for gonococcal septic arthritis is favorable. The vast majority of patients enjoy full return of joint function, although complications related to dissemination can occur. Time to treatment is also critical. Studies have shown that a delay in treatment greater than seven days from onset of infection leads to worse outcomes. Multiple other factors have been shown to be implicated in long-term outcomes. So what's MK's prognosis? She had no major joint injury, received timely treatment, and her pathogen has a low risk of causing permanent joint damage. MK is lucky, since her prognosis is largely favorable. In summary, the differential diagnosis for monoarticular arthropathy includes infectious, rheumatologic, crystalline, and potentially neoplastic etiology. The best way to diagnose septic arthritis is actually sampling synovial fluid and sending it for cell count, gram stain, and culture. Treatment involves abscess evacuation and antibiotics, which should be delivered as soon as septic arthritis is suspected but preferably after cultures of synovial fluid and blood are obtained. Prognosis depends on previous condition of the joint, infectious pathogen, time to treatment, and other factors. Here's a suggested list of materials for more reading on septic arthritis. Thank you for your attention.